Hello, Augies Worldwide. I'm Dave Kassler, amateur radio call sign KE0OG, here with another episode of Ask Dave. Uh, today's question comes to us from Dr. Chassels Limited. Uh, that is his username on uh, Patreon. And he asks a question. Now, he is one of my patrons. I want to say a special thank you to you for being a patron. You too can become a patron of this channel by going to patreon.com slash ke0og and finding a way that works for you. All right, let's take a look at Dr. Chassels. He's our patron already, so we don't need to mention another patron. It says, hi Dave, I found myself watching several of your videos daily. I am planning to use NVIS for local area communications and ARES nets yet want to have a good distance communication from the same 65-foot multiband folded dipole antenna. I purchased three Channel Master telescoping antenna masts. You're going to have to guide those. Each is 40 feet tall. You're definitely going to have to guide those. I believe that the height should give me optimum NVIS effect on 80 meters. Okay, uh, NVIS stands for Near Vertical Incidence Skywave Propagation. It's where you bounce a signal up, it hits the ionosphere and comes back down. Now, that's the way it's usually described. Actually, it can go up at an angle, bounce, and come down anywhere within about a 500 mile diameter circle. Okay, so it does go off to the side a little bit. So we want an antenna that primarily launches the signal up. Now the way you can do that is to, you do this with horizontal propagation. And you want to put your dipole at about 10% of a wavelength high. So for uh, 80 meters, that's eight meters, uh, that's about 24, 25 feet would be the optimum for that. Now, if you put that up higher than that, you'll tend to spread the broadcasting, not broadcasting, we don't broadcast, your transmissions out a little bit more. Okay, Is there an optimum angle for both NVIS and DX? No, not really. The optimum height for a... A dipole to have a single lobe as low as you can get it before you start developing additional lobes is a quarter wave which would be uh, no, I'm sorry a half wave which would be 40 meters or 120 feet so a tenth of a meter to a quarter wave you've got a lot of room in there that you can play with so if you happen to have 40 foot masts fine uh, go ahead and do that, uh, but note that you'll get NVIS on 80 to a degree, but not on 40 so much because uh, the optimum height for 40 meters is 20 meters or 30 feet. So you've got your uh, dipole for 40 meters. If you're using that same antenna for 40 meters, it's at the optimum height to spread that signal out toward the horizon there. That's why I would recommend you come down with that antenna if you want to do NVIS on four of those. Now let's think about 20 through 10. Again, half wavelength on 20, 10 meters, 30 feet. Okay, so that same antenna that runs for NVIS on 80 would be the perfect height for a 20 meter dipole. So you get lots of nice propagation out. Now, I would warn you that on the multi-band dipoles, the lowest band will have the cleanest lobes. If you look at the plan view, look down on the propagation out, you'll see your classic dipole pattern on 80 and to some degree 40 meters. But as you get up in the bandwidth, you start getting these really weird lobes on the thing. So beware that you might get DX into one part of Italy and you can't hear a guy 100 miles away from that guy in Italy because of the way these uh, lobes or side lobes uh, are set up. Okay, um, 
My second question revisits your recent grounding videos. I intend to drive a ground rod at the base of each steel antenna mast and bond is steel heavy. Wow. Antenna, yeah, it is heavy. I guess that's what they're made of. Uh, some masts are aluminum, uh, but they're nowhere near as strong as the steel. You know, aluminum and steel, if you compare them, they, aluminum is stronger weight for weight. So if you have a bar of aluminum that weighs 20 pounds and a bar of steel that weighs 20 pounds, the aluminum bar is going to be stronger. Except the aluminum bar is going to be this big and the steel bar this big. Okay, so beware. Okay, let's see here. We've got uh, about 32 feet apart from each other and about 20 feet from the ground rod next to my house. Okay, yes, you want to bound, uh, you want to um, bond those together and put the, the ground rod at each one of them, ground it to the steel tower. Note here the difference in metals. Copper versus steel is an invitation for corrosion. So what a lot of people do is they fix it so that the thing they're connecting to is stainless, which tends to corrode much less. It's not perfect, but much less. And they connect the stainless to the stainless steel tower. Okay, and there are little connectors that will do this, or you can make something of your own. One thing that I have found that works is you've got a clamp or something with a bolt coming up. The bolt is stainless steel. So you put a washer on there and then put your copper wire there and then put another washer on top of that. That way the stainless steel is all that the copper sees and the tower being steel, regular steel, structural steel, um, only sees the stainless. And that way you keep the copper and the structural steel apart. Now, yes, it's correct to put a grounding rod at the bottom of each tower. Now, for best practice on grounding, you would want to look at uh, the new book, uh, second edition, Grounding and Bonding from the ARRL. However, that will have you going hog wild on these things uh, to be able to actually withstand a lightning strike um, rather than be protected from nearby lightning strikes. Uh, what you're doing is fine. You're using those masks just to hold up uh, dipole antennas. I think you're fine with what you're doing there. Now, you can connect these together and then from there run it to your station ground by using that number six stranded copper wire that I have talked about, okay, and burying it. And by burying it, you actually get some contact with the ground. It improves your grounding system. Now, if you're concerned about your dogs digging, number six copper wire is a pretty nasty thing to try to chew through. But if you want to put it in aluminum conduit, PVC conduit, or steel pipe conduit, you can. If you're going to do that, you might as well just go with a, a single strand rather than stranded, just a single uh, wire that you put it in those. And then when the dogs dig that up, they can't go any further. Um, and then I think you'll be in good shape, okay? Is it a good idea to run my coax feed line inside of steel conduit underground? You can if you want to. Now, it will not only protect you from your three dogs that like to dig, but also from chipmunks and squirrels and other people who love to chew on that tasty soft rubber that's on the outside of the coax. A lot of coax is direct burial, but you've got to get it down a foot or two before you're going to be protected. And you've got burrowing animals like rabbits that could get down to it too. So yeah, go ahead and put it in something protective. Uh, that'll give you a little protection, a longer, longer life for it. So there you have it. And I hope that you find that helpful. And I thank you again for being a patron. Again, the link to patron is patreon.com slash ke0og. Or if you'd like, Go to decastler.com slash support and pick a way that works for you, like a one-time tip jar or a monthly subscription. 
And if you are not in a position to do any of that, you're welcome all the same. And I'm happy to have you as Augies. Please subscribe and please click like. That really helps tell Google that these are great videos. I hope you think they're great videos. And until we next meet, 73.